All right, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yoko Arditi Rocha, and I'm the Executive Director of the Clio Institute, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, the Clio Institute is um, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization based in Florida that focuses on building climate literacy and foster climate action. Um, we focus on building community resilience and active capacity. And for that, we require an informed, engaged, and prepared public. Uh, the Clio Institute has been um, working in the state of Florida for about a decade now, and we use the most climate um, and embedded scientific information uh, for our educational pro uh, programs. Uh, some of the uh, organizations that we work closely with um, are shown here in your screen. Um, and, and you're gonna be hearing from two experts today um, that are gonna be talking about you know, the current state of the, of the climate, uh, the outlook for the um, current hurricane season that just started yesterday and what the state of Florida is preparing uh, to get us climate ready. But before I start, I'd like to take a moment to um, explain you a little bit in a short video what the Clio Institute is and what we do um, on a daily basis. I want you to ask yourselves those tough questions, the ones we avoid, how we want to live, what do we want for our children, what do we want for our planet? Our atmosphere is so finely tuned for what we need, and we're treating it like a dumping ground, a sewer. The health impact of climate change is a global problem, and we see the results of that on a local level. If we fail to act now, then we will leave behind a fundamentally degraded planet for our children and grandchildren, a planet that resembles the futures that have been portrayed in dystopian Hollywood films, unprecedented, uh, inundation of our coastlines, droughts, floods, heat waves, super storms. That's the future that we will see if we fail to act on climate. The Clio Institute was founded in 2010 with the drive to educate and empower South Floridians to act on climate. Founded by Caroline Lewis, a science teacher by training, her vocation led her to understand what was causing people's apathy towards the glooming climate crisis, knowledge. We're in the middle of the sixth Mass extinction. Today, the Clio Institute is the number one nonprofit organization for climate education, engagement, and advocacy. Through programs like the Clio Speakers Network, Clio trains people to become climate speakers by breaking down the science, impacts, and solutions. Clio's educational efforts are backed by a world-class expert advisory council of scientists, environmentalists, teachers, and government officials. While the world is already feeling the impacts of our changing climate, not everyone is feeling it the same way. Clio is a leader in the climate justice movement, providing the resources and tools to the most vulnerable communities in South Florida that are on the front lines of the climate crisis. I wanted to be an outreach for them. Building communities' resilience through women is the cornerstone of our Empowering Resilient Women program. By teaming up with community members like the YWCA, Clio is able to empower and educate women on how better to prepare for more extreme weather events like hurricanes while building community. Clio works to remove barriers and build a wider coalition to fight climate change across faith-based communities, elected officials, and municipalities, schools, and cultural organizations. One of the most important voices that Clio continues to amplify is that of our youth. What do we want? When do we want it? Now! Their Gen Clio program meets regularly with students across the region, training them to be climate ambassadors in their schools and communities. Dear elected officials, This is a crisis. Do your job. We'll be watching. Clio recently launched its Climate Resilient Schools Initiative to bring their program into the classrooms while building a robust climate curriculum for Miami-Dade public schools. Clio continues to expand its engagement through multimedia outreach, including television commercials, social media, and billboards. With statewide campaigns like the Florida Climate Pledge, I care about climate change. And I care about climate change because it affects everybody regardless of race, culture, and ethnicity. Because I'm passionate about the success of my future. 
I like the Clio Institute because it takes the time to educate people about the importance of climate change and the things that we can do to improve our world. You can have your voice heard too. Fund our climate action work today. The future of Florida is in your hands. Great. So I'd like to put into context our conversation today. We're going to be talking about the current outlook of the hurricane season and the connection to our changing climate. I'd like to start by saying there's scientific consensus that the Earth climate is warming. 97% of all the world's climate scientists agree that human activity is to blame. There is too much greenhouse gas buildup into the atmosphere. All these heat trapping gases due to our fossil fuel based economy are creating a blanket around that planet that are not, that are not letting that extra go back to space. And so the la latest readings from the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii for CO2 uh, show a very drastic increase from one year to another. If you can look at the screen from 2019 to 2020, you can see a, a significant increase. And the graph below also tells you uh, our, the consistency in increasing heat trapping gases. But this graph shows you a, a, a much clearer picture. As you can see, scientific um, and scientists have been very, very precise in measuring greenhouse gases, specifically CO2. The red line here shows levels of CO2 going back a hundred thousands of years ago and the white line shows you temperature. As you can see there's a very direct connection uh, between the two of us. There's a very direct correlation. As CO2 levels goes up, temperatures level also go up. As temperatures um, go down, you can see that they correlate to lower levels of CO2. And so we have been able to track CO2 measurements in our atmosphere for hundreds of thousands of years ago. But when we look at current times, this is where we are. If you look at the top hand, at the top corner of your screen, we are at 418.32 parts per million. These are unprecedented levels uh, since humans um, ha inhabit the earth. So we have putting a lot of heat trapping gases into that atmosphere, causing our earth to warm. And if we look at the headlines in the past few years, and, and you've seen that the scientific community is sounding the alarm bells. They have told us that we need to put forward swift, bold climate action policies in place in order to curb the temperatures to 1.5 degrees to up to 2.5 zero degrees Celsius. And so the alarms have been deafening. We are, we are in the most vulnerable state to climate change and, Flo and many Florida cities are at risk. But the headlines have been really inundated also recently by the coronavirus and, and the current public uh, health pandemic we are experiencing. But there are some very direct parallels that I like to point out. And I think the, the most important one is, you know, the fact that uh, ignoring science causes people life. And so this year, um, the scientific um, organization, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, also known by NOAA, has already forecasted a very busy Atlantic hurricane season. And for, all, for many of us here in, in, in Florida, that is very relevant. And for those of you who are joining us from the Southeast or some parts of the Caribbean as well. And for that, we have invited two top experts that are gonna tell you, you know, what that active season may look like, the connection between warming waters and hurricanes, and also what the state um, and counties may be doing to prepare and get us ready for our climate reality. Now, before I start, I'd also like to point out that the seas before the season started, we had already named two um, tropical storms. In fact, we're in the you know, on our way to, to name the third one. And so for that, I'd like to um, welcome our first guest today. Um, uh, Mr. John Morales is the Chief Meteorologist of NBC6. Um, and he is also a CLIO member of the Borough of Directors. So we're very um, happy to have him join us today. Mr. Morales um, is um, the Chief Meteorologist of NBC in Miami, Florida, and also a fellow of the American Meteorologist Society. 
During his 36 year professional career, Mr. Morales has worked in the public sector and in the private sector. Um, John has attained his undergraduate de degree in atmospheric sciences from Cornell University in 1984. And he's currently a candidate for a master's degree in environmental science and policy at John Hopkins University. Mr. Morales has won numerous awards, including Emmy Awards for his TV presentations. And he was inducted into the National Academy of Television, Arts and Sciences, Silver Circle for 25 or more years of distinguished work in broadcasting. Welcome, John. It's great to have you. Um, so t please, let's just um, tell us what does a busy hurricane season mean? And what is, um, you know, for us in South Florida, what does that mean? And, and, and tell us what you're anticipating in this active hurricane season. You're good to go. Thank you for unmuting me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'm so glad I have a microphone standing right here next to me uh, to uh, to be able to signal you that uh, you couldn't hear me. Um, well, first of all, first off, I want to thank you for subtracting ten years out of my of my life of my age because I graduated Cornell in 1984 and not 1994. So thank you. My my bad, but hey, you know what? You can use those ten years. Anybody can use that. And, Ten years. All right. So uh, let me let me share the screen here, um, and uh, this is going to allow me, I hope, to be able to show you a couple of things. And we'll start off uh, with uh, something that's been in the news uh, recently, which is the uh, U.S. Uh, Agency for Ocean and Atmosphere, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, their climate uh, branch. Uh, put out their seasonal forecast for the 2020 hurricane season. And if you look at the pie chart and you add up the numbers there, you're going to see that there is a 70% chance that the season will be at or above normal, according to NOAA. And then on the right-hand side of this uh, graphic, taken right off their website, it shows the range of the number of tropical storms that they're expecting for this year. Keep in mind that average is 12. Uh, so uh, by forecasting 13 to 19, uh, that is definitely above normal. The average number of hurricanes in a year is six, and they're forecasting up to 10. And the average number of major hurricanes is two to three, and they're, average, they're forecasting as many as six, which is a bit alarming, I would say. Uh, to think that there could be six major hurricanes somewhere in the Atlantic, Caribbean, and Gulf of Mexico during this 2020 year. Now, NOAA uh, does garner most of the attention in terms of forecasts for hurricane seasons. But here's a handy page uh, that uh, shows that NOAA is not the only entity that is forecasting or that writes these forecasts for uh, hurricane season. Uh, there is uh, these days almost two dozen uh, academic, private, and government entities, institutions that uh, write seasonal forecasts. And uh, doesn't matter which column you look at here, I mean, we can use the name storm column because I told you NOAA is forecasting 13 to 19. So if you want to find NOAA, and hopefully you can see my cursor here. Here's NOAA's forecast, 13 to 19 tropical storms. But if I take the cursor away, you'll notice that uh, you know, NOAA is one of, uh, one of an entire consensus of uh, different entities that are forecasting an above normal year uh, across the Atlantic. And some give you just one number, like uh, actually not this, uh, let's use this one. Uh, Maxar must be a private entity. Uh, their forecasting looks like 15, and others give you a wide range, right? This is Penn State University, which is forecasting as many as, looks like 23 or 24. That would put, if, if Penn State were to verify with the high end of their forecast, that would put this season on par with a season that um, uh, is uh, uh, legendary for being uh, hyperactive, which was the 2005 hurricane season 15 years ago when we ran out of names, uh, of the list of names for Atlantic tropical storms, and we had to go to the Greek alphabet and start naming storms with that because there were so many storms, 28 storms, uh, to be precise, that year. 
Now, uh, the, the consensus is definitely for an above normal year. There are a couple of outliers here. Uh, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, uh, these are the people that write the Euro uh, model, right? They, they host and, and uh, code and uh, uh, send out uh, twice a day uh, the European uh, forecast model, which uh, many people are familiar with. Uh, you know how accurate it is. But, but this is a different ballgame. Here, here they're not forecasting the weather. They're forecasting how uh, an entire six months is going to be like. So it's forecasting climate, and it's a different deal. So I just want to point out that one outlier, and then here's another one from the UK Met Office, which uh, you could argue is forecasting a near normal to slightly above normal year. But just about every other forecast here is for a year that will be above normal. Let's go to the major hurricane uh, uh, category here. These are the ones, the major hurricanes are the ones that cause the bulk of the destruction. They bring the biggest storm surge, the highest winds, um, and often the heaviest rain, although you can get some very heavy rains from very weak systems as well. I mean, we're just seeing right, that right now in Central America with Amanda, uh, now future Cristobal, uh, which uh, it's already produced 20 inches of rain and massive destruction and loss of life in places like El Salvador uh, due to the very heavy rains down there. But the bottom line as you look at this is that the forecast consensus is for an above normal active hurricane season. And the main reason for that, and again, I'm assuming you can see my cursor, is that when you look at the main development region in the tropical Atlantic between the African coast and the, here are the Cabo Verde Islands, uh, all the way to the Lesser Antilles and into the Caribbean and even into the Gulf of Mexico, this is all showing temperatures that are above normal, okay? This is your sea surface temperature anomalies across uh, uh, the entire planet, and you're seeing temperatures that are one to two degrees hotter than uh, normal there. There's some pockets of colder than normal water uh, north of the 30th parallel here and extending up uh, way up into the Atlantic off the coast of Newfoundland there in Canada. Uh, and, but generally speaking, where these systems form is down here and in the Caribbean and in the Bahamas and in the Gulf of Mexico. And all that is showing above normal sea surface temperatures. Meanwhile, let me call your attention out here to the equatorial Pacific Ocean. And you'll notice an entire band there of uh, below normal, colder than normal sea surface temperatures. And that is uh, indication that we could soon have a La Nina phenomenon forming. The La Nina uh, is when sea surface temperatures in the equatorial Pacific Ocean are colder than normal. The El Nino is when they are warmer than normal. And without getting too much into the weeds here, uh, let me just tell you that during La Nina years, uh, one of the consequences of having colder than normal temperatures here in the uh, equatorial Pacific is that upper level winds, you know, uh, up there at uh, 15, 20, 25, or 30,000 feet above us, the upper level winds are, that cross Central America into the Caribbean and the main development region of the Atlantic tend to be weaker or uh, certainly not showing a strong westerly component. You're just not getting a lot of westerly winds aloft. Therefore, the amount of wind shear diminishes. And one of the things that tropical cyclones uh, need, in addition to warm water, to be able to uh, grow and thrive and become strong is the lack of that uh, uh, strong difference in wind direction and wind speed between the surface where we're sitting at and what's happening up above, okay? So less wind shear, which is what happens when you have a La Nina forming, generally results in a greater chance of a lot of these tropical depressions and storms actually becoming hurricanes or possibly major hurricanes. So that is a big concern this year and one of the reasons that uh, that the forecast calls uh, for, for what it indeed calls for. Uh, all right, let me switch what I'm sharing here uh, briefly, and I'm going to switch to, let me see how I'm doing enough time. Uh, I'm doing okay, right? 
Uh, lot eight, four more minutes, you say? You, you're doing good. Okay, four more minutes. Uh, let me uh, share uh, this. And then I can do this. All right, so you should be looking at a slide that says uh, Florida climate crisis, hurricanes. Um, and, and this work has been going on for quite a number of years. Now, this is uh, work at um, NAWS Princeton a Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab, or GFDL lab. Um, and this is work by Tom Knudsen and others at GFDL. And, and again, it's work that's been going on for quite some time. But here's the headline news. Here's the, the I almost call it breaking news, because this almost happened in the last two weeks. You look at this trend line there, and what the trend line is showing you is that generally speaking, looking at tropical cyclones around the world, and I'm using that generic term tropical cyclones because that encompasses hurricanes, typhoons, and you know Australian and Indian and Bangladeshi uh, 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 cyclones. It's the generic term for everything uh, tropically, uh, like a tropical storm or hurricane around the world. And what we're seeing is that a greater percentage of these tropical cyclones, a greater proportion, if you will, of tropical cyclones around the world in the satellite era are reaching those catastrophic intensities like a Hurricane Maria or a Hurricane Irma or a Harvey uh, or an uh, uh, Irma, if I already mentioned it, I think I did. Um, uh, more, more of those are reaching that intensity around the world. So. Uh, if I go back to this slide, we're just seeing records being set left and right um, for intensity in particular, for rainfall as well, with hurricanes dumping more rain than ever in many locations. And there are some very robust links to the changing climate uh, having to do with many of these records that we're seeing. Dorian for the highest uh, 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 maximum wind outside of the tropical belt, in other words, north of Tropic of Cancer, uh, when it hit the Bahamas, strongest ever to strike the Bahamas. Uh, Lorenzo also last year, the easternmost Cat 5 hurricane ever observed in the Atlantic. We had never had a Cat 5 where Lorenzo attained Cat 5 intensity. And if, if you don't want to go as, as high in, uh, in intensity as a Cat 5, just any hurricane, you look at any hurricane ever in the Atlantic, shouldn't say ever, ever on record in the Atlantic, uh, we've just never recorded one as far east as Hurricane Pablo in 2019. Rainfall records from Harvey, 60 inches of rain from one hurricane in Texas, Florence about uh, 45 to 50 inches of rain in the Carolinas, Lane and um, uh, Hawaii, Barry, which was just a tropical storm, also producing rainfall records. Uh, Go back to 2017, Irma, world record for the longest continuous Cat 5 hurricane. Uh, now the Atlantic Basin, all the way at the bottom of the slide, the Atlantic Basin now holds the wor world record for any tropical basin around the world for the highest accumulated cyclone energy index in one month. And that happened in September 2017 when we had uh, Irma and Maria and Jose and, and all the and Harvey, all these other hurricanes that were so strong that we, by, by the measure of this index, which is a combination of the longevity of a hurricane and the intensity of a hurricane, and you mix all the ones that we had that year, and now we've got the Western Pacific, which is legendary for its typhoons and super typhoons, we've got them beat too, <laughs> just because of the sheer number of hurricanes that we've seen in the Atlantic. So going back to the slide, th th this is the headline. Two weeks ago, we had uh, a paper uh, published by these folks at GFDL that shows uh, mathematically a statistical significance in this trend. So before it was just a trend that we were observing, but finally there's the, uh, the, the uh, scientific uh, statistical robust measure of the significance of this trend. In other words, it's not by chance. Uh, this is happening for a reason, and we're seeing a greater proportion of Cat 4s and 5s around the world, uh, and it's happening because we're changing the speed limit on hurricanes. The physics of how hurricanes strengthen and how intense can those winds become, that 
physics aspect is changing because of the hotter sea surface temperatures, the depth of the layer of warm water located there in the ocean, more instability in the atmosphere, uh, all those things uh, lead, and, and more uh, vapor content, water vapor content in the atmosphere too, all those things combined lead to a greater chance for more of these hurricanes becoming Cat 4s and Cat 5s going through these rapid intensification phases uh, with greater frequency, which is a separate paper that has also shown that that is happening uh, uh, as well. So the bottom line is there is a forecast for a very busy uh, 2020 hurricane season. Uh, we don't really know where these hurricanes uh, will move towards. Hopefully uh, it'd be great if they could all stay out at sea. So we're not forecasting necessarily how many landfalls there's going to be, but I can tell you this, if there's going to be more tropical storms and more hurricanes and a half dozen major hurricanes as the NOAA high-end forecast calls for, well, there's definitely going to be a greater chance that we're going to tangle with one. Miami has been very fortunate. Uh, Southeast Florida has been remarkably fortunate. Uh, as major hurricanes have passed to our south, to our west, to our east, and to our north, but we've missed out on the big one. And we haven't had a big one down here since 1992, which is an entire generation. Uh, the day that we get another hurricane, like the great Miami hurricane of 1926, uh, you know, a Cat 4 type of hurricane crossing our region from southeast to northwest, it's going to be a $100 billion disaster uh, or greater. And uh, it's going to be uh, tremendously difficult, not just economically, but in terms of uh, suffering as well. And like Yoka said earlier, in these extreme weather events that are increasing due to global warming around the planet, usually it's the less fortunate that are hit the hardest. And we've seen a lot of that in the headline news these days. Uh, social justice, environmental justice, climate justice, these are all things that are linked together and uh, hotter uh, temperatures around the planet and the oceans are exacerbating the injustices that we see out there. Uh, so with that, I think I'll pass the baton back to um, uh, Yoka for more. Thank you, John. Um, and we're gonna get into Q&A uh, once we, we're done with um, both you and, and David in a minute, but I wanna make sure our audience knows that you can start typing your questions in the Q&A um, section and also all the links to the web page that um, John has uh, shown us as well as the recording of the webinar and a couple of other resources will follow up on an email um, tomorrow so be in the lookout for that because I know somebody already had, was asking about the resources that you were sharing John so they would like to um, get a hold of those links as well um, and once we get into the the, the q and I'll start to ask you a couple of questions but just put it in context for some people, you know, uh, the, the, the majority of the heat and the majority of greenhouse gases are being absorbed by our ocean. And hence we're seeing not only, you know, the increased amount of warming and in, in, in surface temperatures, but also in deeper um, um, levels of our oceans as well, as well as uh, ocean acidification that are affecting a lot of our uh, marine ecosystems. And, and so I wanted to just kind of make that connection for some people that may not be so um, climate literate. So um, with that, obviously the, the outlook of the season looks um, pretty grim. Um, and, and for us in South Florida and for the entire state of Florida, um, we always need to be getting ready for, for the big one. And, and with that, I'd like to introduce our next um, speaker. Uh, and let me just want to make sure I share my screen. Um, and David, I'll make sure that I don't take any years off from you. I promise that, <laughs> like I did with John. Uh, but um, it is our pleasure to welcome David Merrick. Uh, David Merrick is the director of the Center for Disaster Risk Policy and the Emergency Management and Homeland Security Program at Florida State University. His research and interest areas include emergency management planning and policy, remote sensing and unmanned aircraft systems in emergency manager, disaster logistics, crisis mapping, and information technology in, in, in emergency management. His team is part of the state of Florida's response system and has been deployed to Bay County, Florida in response to Hurricane Michael, as well as for Hurricane Matthew, Harvey, Irma, and Dorian. 
He has extensive experience in emergency management training and exercises for all levels of government, facilitated plan review and development, developed bioterrorism preparedness programs, and has provided expert technical assistance on a variety of governmental emergency management pro projects. David has led the development of critical just-in-time systems supporting local, state, and federal emergency managers. He currently teaches foundations of emer emergency management, emer emergency management planning and policy, and disaster system at Florida State University. Welcome, David. It's, a, it's great to have you also with us today. I'm going to mute you now. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, great to participate. Uh, I already learned some things from, from John this morning, so that's uh, this afternoon, so that's fantastic. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. There we go. So I've just got a um, couple slides that I want to go through real quick, but uh, really just want to kind of talk a bit and then encourage everybody to ask questions. Uh, when we get to the Q and A, so so John mentioned, you know, a generation ago, Hurricane Andrew, August of 1992, um, and I use this as an example um, because of, a, and this is not the first year that we have had discussions about um, climate forecasts regarding how intense a hurricane season is going to be, um, and yes, we are well above average uh, again this year. Um, but I use Andrew as an example um, when we talk about preparedness in particular, uh, because the 92 season was well below average. There were seven hurricanes, um, four named storm, or seven named storms, four hurricanes, and one major hurricane. And that was Andrew, which didn't occur until August, um, well into hurricane season. And, you know, just as a, as a comparison, um, Cristobal was just named officially uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, as the third storm of the season, and we're two days into it. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's important from a planning perspective and from an emergency management perspective to understand that it doesn't take 16 storms to, to create a bad season. It can just be one, and that one can be the first storm. It can be Andrew. Um, so, you know, that's, and that's kind of the mindset that uh, emergency managers at every level, the, the local, state, and the federal level, um, kind of keep in mind. Um, we certainly don't want to see a 2004 season or a 2005 season, um, but um, the, the, the forecasts and, and the predictions of how many storms we're going to have doesn't necessarily mean um, how many major storms and how much impact we're going to have uh, on Florida or surrounding states. Um, you know, in a perfect world, they would all be fish storms, they would all stay out to sea, um, and, and that's what we go for. But uh, but that's not uh, not always the case. So the other issue, you know, kind of something that's been driving all of the emergency management discussions uh, at the state and the county level and the federal level um, for the past three months is how do we deal with hurricanes while we deal with COVID? Um, and there's been a lot, it's been a lot of discussion, right? And this, uh, and, and, and from, from, the very first, when we, we activated emergency operations centers, including the one here in, the, in Tallahassee for the state of Florida, uh, when we activated them in March, um, it immediately became clear that we couldn't operate as normal. We couldn't run this event um, the same way that we have run major events and hurricanes in the past, just from you know, the two obvious things regarding our workforce uh, and our workplaces, right? So, so immediately we had to put into effect screening. How do we make sure that uh, these people uh, that are coming into an emergency operations center that are responsible for managing a variety of functions, um, but all are coming from different workplaces, um, they're coming to do different jobs, they all work for different agencies. How do we ensure that, uh, that we're not, you know, spreading coronavirus inside an EOC? So that, that we had to put into a place screening uh, everybody that goes into an EOC is getting their temperature taken um, to make sure they're not running a fever. We're ensuring that uh, the people are wearing masks. But then the other issue is uh, 
inside an emergency operations center, and this is true at the, at the county level as well as at the state level, um, the whole purpose that those rooms exist is to enable that face-to-face -face communication and collaboration um, so that all these different agencies and, and different levels of government can, can respond effectively. Uh, and because we're, it's designed to, to enable that face-to-face -face, uh, collaboration, it, it, it tends to pack people into, into small rooms and in big rooms uh, and high density, and that's not going to work. Um, so uh, a lot of agencies, including the state of Florida, have, have looked at how we're going to spread that out. So, uh, you know, one of the advantages of, of, in this particular instance of the COVID situation is the fact that most state buildings are currently empty, right? The workforces are working remotely. Um, so we're able to spread out from the traditional EOC into um, other conference facilities, meeting rooms, things like that. So it, it, it allowed us to kind of move the workforce uh, a little farther apart, right? And to enable some of that social distancing. And then again, we, we've certainly embraced the virtual technologies that, that a lot of you are familiar with now, uh, including Zoom, right? Right here we are on Zoom. I mean, we can run disasters this way as well. So it's kind of required us to, to rethink the way emergency management is done uh, and, and try to do that in a way that doesn't limit our capability. At the same time, we're seeing um, a lot of thinking outside the box, a lot of attempts to innovate how we do things, right? Um, and a lot of that is going to depend upon uh, technology to enable uh, information transfer and collaboration to happen without as much face-to-face -face, um, interaction. And I think that's going to really improve um, kind of the speed that, uh, that survivors and, and those impacted by disaster, the speed at which they receive services. Um, and you know, two of, the, two of the best examples I have of that are, are really tightly linked. First, for the first time here in 2020, we're seeing a possibility of using um, what we call remote sensing or imagery taken from airplanes, typically after a disaster, using that, that type of imagery to do the formal and official damage assessments. Uh, and the damage assessment is, is really kind of the linchpin that, um, that enables the federal assistance to begin flowing. So uh, in the past, that has been a, a kind of on the ground type of uh, event where uh, federal, local, and state representatives get together and they, they survey the damage physically, they talk to people that are impacted, uh, and they're trying to get a count uh, and try to quantify what the damage is to a community. Uh, and we're starting to realize, particularly as we as we make advancements in this area, that we can do a lot of that work um, using imagery without necessarily having to put people into the field um, or uh, talk to people face to face immediately. Um, and so that's going to speed that up. And then the insurance industry um, has has kind of embraced this type of, of new technology as well. Uh, and something that we're starting to see or we've already seen uh, going back to 2018. Uh, for Hurricane Michael, some insurance companies were able to uh, kind of contact policy owners um, and the insurance company was initiating that contact and saying, hey, we've seen, um, we've seen that you, uh, your, your, your property has been damaged and they're starting that claims process uh, as quickly as possible. So, uh, so that technology is really speeding things along and that's, uh, I think it's going to really um, enable us uh, to respond better. Um, last thing I want to, uh, well, lost my slides. Well, there we go. Well, you can probably see that here. Nope. Go back, maybe. There we go. Okay. Um, one thing I just want to point out is all disasters are local. So I encourage everybody to understand uh, where to get information from your local emergency manager. Um, you know, the state is there to support the counties. Uh, and that's a key, and that's not a that's not just a, a COVID thing. That's a, that's kind of the way we do things. Uh, the state and the federal levels are there to support the cities and the counties, uh, and because they're the ones who have the best um, understanding of what's going on in their communities. Uh, but you can go to FloridaDisaster.org/counties and get a link to your county emergency management. They're going to be your best source of information uh, in a disaster. And then as well, you know, the other key piece of information you need is, is know your evacuation zone. Uh, and, and again, the, the, the state website has links to your county um, websites that'll have that, that zone information. Uh, that's probably one of the most important things you can know. Uh, and also realize that uh, one of the things that's going to be impacted during the COVID era is, is sheltering. Um, the more prepared that you are 
individually and have a, an evacuation plan that may not require having to depend upon shelters, uh, be that hotels, friends and family, I think the happier everyone's going to be because we're still, um, we're still working out how we're gonna do that because um, we certainly aren't gonna be able to do sheltering the same way that we have um, in previous years. So uh, I'll tell you what, with that, I'll turn it back over so we can have plenty of time for uh, questions and answers. Great, yes, thank you. And we have uh, plenty coming in already today. Um, so I'll, I'll start by just saying a, 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 a couple of things. To first, uh, an announcement is to let our audience know that we are in the midst of our um, disaster preparedness sales tax holiday, that it's about to expire in two days. So June 4th is the last day to get a, a sales tax break. And um, hopefully you, everybody is already getting prepared and putting their, their hurricane preparedness kits and action plans together. So I wanted to uh, make sure I, I mentioned that. Um, and the first first question I'll have is for John. Um, you know, with, uh, you know, Hurricane Dorian was a, a hurricane for the records. Um, you, you stated that quite clearly. Um, and somebody's asking, isn't it time we looked at increasing the levels of categories and perhaps create a new category, category six um, hurricane? Yes. You should not be on mute. I'm going to unmute to um, David so we can have a more Thank you. A flowing um, well, uh, so I, I think I think there are some uh, scientists out there that uh, support that idea that there ought to be a Cat Six. I guess maybe starting at 180 or around that threshold miles per hour. Um, Carrie Emanuel, for example, a prominent climate scientist at MIT who I have visited and interviewed and, um, uh, and, and, and seen some quite alarming, alarming projections, as a matter of fact, of what to expect later this century with the, uh, the intense tropical cyclones in the Atlantic. Uh, he's a proponent of that idea. But on the other hand, I, I, let me tell you this. Um, once you reach category four, I mean, there's really not much difference between a Cat 4 and a Cat 5 or a proposed Cat 6. It's catastrophic. You get hit head on in the core of a Cat 4, in the eye wall of a Cat 4, uh, and it's going to be catastrophic. Maria in Puerto Rico is a good example. That was a Category 4 hurricane. The Great Miami Hurricane of 1926 was a Category 4 hurricane. And just like that, uh, there's many, many examples. So uh, once you reach a certain threshold of wind speed and height of the storm surge, uh, I, I don't think it matters whether you classify it as a 6 or a 5 or a 4. They're all horrific and all something to be extremely scared about. Uh, you know, and I know that when I deliver my weather information and my weather warnings, I do it in a calm way. I think I'm known for that after all these years on TV. But the reason many of you saw me so alarmed for Hurricane Irma in 2017 was because the forecast was for it to hit Miami as a Cat 4 or 5 hurricane. And let me tell you, if that's what's expected, I too, I'm going to be uh, hyping things up, which I normally don't. And I think the only other time I've hyped something up was Andrew in 1992, because I was on the air for that as well. Um, thankfully, uh, for the metro area, that did not come to fruition, but the lower Florida Keys did have to tangle uh, with a, a major hurricane, which produced a humongous storm surge, and of course, damage from wind too. Uh, so, so that's my answer to the uh, Cat 6 idea. Okay, great, thank you. And we do have a lot of great questions coming in, so I'm gonna to try to compile a few of them. This one is gonna be for you, David. Um, and you mentioned you know, some of the um, specific preparations that are happening in lieu of um, COVID-19. Um, and so somebody is asking if, if you think uh, uh, this hurricane season could lead to, could lead to an increase in risk of contracting um, uh, COVID-19 and also what kind of, um, um, you know, preparations are happening at a state level with local counties. Um, can you expand on that? Yeah. So uh, to the first part of the question, could it, could it increase the risk of contracting COVID? Um, if you if the if if you could 
hit by a storm and you're evacuating and you end up in a, in a congregate shelter where you're in close contact with others, then yes, there, there could be an impact. Uh, and that's exactly what we're trying to avoid, right? We're trying to avoid those congregate shelters, which is um, another way of saying, you know, we, we, we can't pack a gymnasium full of people on cots the way that we might have um, in previous, uh, in previous um, seasons. And so we're trying to, to come up with, and we're being successful, come up with some, some alternate plans, including perhaps using um, hotels or motels or um, other things like that, where we can put individual families in individual rooms, right? And that helps um, kind of eliminate that face-to-face uh, contact, which is where uh, the majority of, of transmission is, is coming from right now. So, um, you know, and, and the other thing we're looking at from a, from a planning perspective is trying to understand what the public's behavior will be, right? And this is something that we've, uh, we've been doing here in Florida from the emergency management side and is, is surveying Floridians uh, consistently since 1997. Uh, about what they would be doing this year if they were threatened by a hurricane. Um, and so we, we, you know, we're, that process is ongoing right now. We're still trying to gather uh, information. And, and sometimes the best way to figure out what the public is going to do is to ask them directly. Uh, and I think what we're going to see is that we're going to see the, the public being less dependent upon government shelters, whatever those might look like, uh, and more dependent on, you know, we will we'll go to stay with family or, uh, or get a hotel or, or those types of solutions, which is typically a, a large portion of where evacuees, um, evacuees end up. And of course, we're also looking at how do we provide support from the state level down to the locals uh, in all of this, right? And from a planning standpoint, as well as providing personnel, uh, whether that be, you know, people from other county emergency management coming into the impacted areas to help run shelters uh, or using the National Guard or a variety of other resources, right? Because we, we understand it's going to be um, a much more resource intensive event from a, you know, to, to, to shelter people uh, in 2020. So we're, we're, we're making those plans. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and this, the next one is for John. Um, and I'm going to try to pile two in one. Um, the first one is, is there a way to predict what phase of the Northern Atlantic Oscillation will, be, will likely be by the time we get to the peak month of the season? And then uh, the other one is, um, somebody would like a bit of more of an explanation as to what you discussed with regards to the Nina, La Nina and um, hurricanes. If there's, um, you know, if you can explain more about that relationship. You. Um, okay. Don't, don't mute yourself. <laughs> well, I mean, sometimes I'm typing away and I don't want to interrupt David. So. Sounds good. <laughs> um, all right, about the uh, North Atlantic Oscillation. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, down the road, there are ways to forecast that. Uh, but the signals that most of the long-term predictions utilize uh, to forecast the behavior of a hurricane season are more linked to things that, that are, I guess, easier to forecast, like the ENSO, like the El Nino Southern Oscillation, and whether it's going to be an El Nino neutral or a La Nina a type of situation. Uh, let me tell you, I mean, if, if, uh, if certain conditions were to uh, come together, uh, you know, we might have a big dip in the jet stream along the east coast of the U.S., and that would deflect all storms or most storms and make them recurve out into the Atlantic. But that doesn't happen every year and uh, some years instead we have a big blocking high and it drives all the storms and hurricanes right into Florida. What type of a pattern are we going to have in August and September and October, the three peak months of hurricane season? That's tough to tell uh, at this time. I will tell you though that uh, the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, which is a longer term, uh, longer uh, period or term natural cycle in the Atlantic, um, we're a quarter of a century into that already. That started in 1995, and we are in the uh, warm phase of that. It has meant uh, that we've seen more uh, hurricanes in the Atlantic since 1995. There are stretches of 20 to 40 years in which we see less. So we wonder when this AMO, Atlantic Multilocational Oscillation, is going to shift into the colder phase. As far as the La Nina is concerned, I mean, there are global repercussions to this very well understood uh, 
uh, climate connection. And these are short-term climate variations. It's not, when we talk about El Nino and La Nina, we're not necessarily talking about, you know, anthropogenic climate change. We're talking about these natural cycles uh, that occur in the Pacific and that have repercussions all around the world. Uh, the bottom line is that when you have the La Nina and you have those colder sea surface temperatures, because it's colder at the surface, you know, where the ocean is, uh, that colder water in contact with air makes the air colder. Colder air is more dense, therefore it sinks. And instead of having a lot of air bubbling up, like you would doing in a, a El Nino, where the air is warm, it bubbles up into the top, up top of the atmosphere when it reaches, or the troposphere, when you reach the top of the uh, troposphere, which is the lower level of the atmosphere, uh, that uh, air that's coming up from below needs to spread out. It spreads out in all directions. So during an El Nino, that wind that goes aloft and spreads accentuates the upper level jet stream and makes for stronger winds in the upper atmosphere coming across Central America into the Caribbean, into the main development region of the Atlantic and stronger westerly winds aloft means greater wind shear and therefore less chance that hurricanes will form. The opposite happens in La Nina, the air in the Pacific is sinking, you don't have these accentuated winds aloft and that is the longer explanation as to why La Nina years are more active for hurricanes. Thanks. Um, so uh, this one's for you, David. Um, you know, what has been done in terms of building code reviews to mitigate um, the damage we've seen in storms, specifically after, for example, Hurricane Matthew? Um, you know, after Hurricane Andrew, we did see a, a, a revamp on some building codes. Um, but have we, has, any, has anything happened uh, since 1992? And the second part of, of the question is, somebody's asking also, what are cities, counties, or states doing to address the fact that we can be facing a workforce shortage to help rebuild post-disaster, um, especially, you know, in a world with COVID-19? Well, honestly, um, we haven't done a lot since 92, 93. Uh, you know, Andrew was certainly a, a kind of a watershed event when it came to building code review, and it resulted in, uh, you know, all construction since then in the state is probably um, more resistant to wind damage than anywhere else in the country um, at this point. And that has certainly helped us in, in countless storms uh, since the early 90s. Um, that is not a universal truth, however, right? Uh, building codes are typically a county by county um, uh, decision, right? How, how stringent they go. Uh, the state does provide guidelines uh, and encourages counties to have stronger building codes, um, but it is not, um, it's not a hard and fast requirement. So South Florida def definitely has um, higher wind requirements, wind resistance requirements in their codes um, than other places in the country. Uh, and this is, you know, a, a really interesting example of that, unfortunately, is looking at what happened in, in Bay County uh, after Hurricane Michael in 2018. Um, their codes were not um, to the same standard as, as you would see in, in South Florida. Uh, and the result is, as you saw, wind damage uh, in that region from that storm um, that if that same storm had hit South Florida, you may not have seen. So. Um, so that's certainly started, we'll call it a discussion, uh, and that's a political discussion uh, in these North Florida counties about how stringent their building code should be. Um, I expect that we will see some, um, some significant changes, um, but, that, uh, but those, those, those arguments uh, slow down reconstruction as well, right? Uh, their reconstruction on Mexico Beach in particular was held up for, for months as they debated what, uh, what uh, the, the new building codes uh, should look like. So um, it's very easy for us as a state to forget um, what the, the lessons that we paid for uh, in previous years. And, um, and I hope we don't do that some more, right? So uh, there, there's actually been talk about loosening building codes that were put in place um, after Andrew um, to, to make housing more affordable and a variety of things. So um, personally, I hope we continue on the course that we're on, which is, uh, you know, better codes is good mitigation, reduces damage, it, it, it results in um, fewer families being uh, displaced after a storm. Um, what was the other part of that question? I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, somebody wanted to know, you know, what are, what are cities or states or, 
yeah, worth right. it. So uh, honestly, I have not, and doesn't mean it's not happening. I have not seen any real discussion about that. Um, it's certainly going to be an issue. Um, but, uh, you know, reconstruction from a, from, and, and recovery after a disaster uh, from a governmental standpoint from the local and, and, and state level uh, is pretty much trying to uh, speed up any bureaucratic issues, make sure financial aid gets where it needs to go. But um, we certainly can't control the workforce. Uh, and that's something we saw, you know, in 2004 when, when roofing contractors were uh, overwhelmed with the need here in the state and we ran out of supplies, we ran out of companies. One of the things we do typically do in a disaster is we enable um, contractors from other states, neighboring states, to use their licenses uh, here in the state of Florida, right? So we, we, we establish the fact, you know, a roofing contractor who has a license in Georgia can come into Florida uh, and do that. And we do the same thing with general contractors and everything else. So that's probably the best thing that government can do um, is to kind of reduce some of those regulatory barriers while still ensuring that the quality work gets done. Great. Thank you. So we are at one o'clock um, and I wanted to just say if uh, um, invite you to, if you have any final remarks before we call it a day. There were some um, questions still on the Q&A chat that I will address and I will send it to you for um, answering. I will send those back in the follow up email that everybody will get in addition with um, the resources shared here today, in addition with um, the recording. Um, and some other um, links that were shared here today. Any final words, John, David? Well, I mean, I'll just say uh, it's, it's been a while and it's not a matter of when, I mean, not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, uh, you know, Southeast Florida, if you live here in Southeast Florida, uh, that uh, we're going to deal and have to tangle with a major hurricane and, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, I, I can push it off and say I hope it doesn't happen in my lifetime while I'm living here, but I mean, I think that would be unrealistic. Um, so, you know, if, if you think that you lived through a major hurricane because, you know, you uh, saw Irma uh, pass 100 miles west of Miami and the wind blew at 100 miles an hour and we had a six-foot storm surge, you're wrong. You haven't survived a major hurricane. That was just a brush by. You know, it, it would be... Uh, orders of magnitude worse than that. It would be a, a, catastro a catastrophe. So, so, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, hurricanes are getting stronger. There is a statistical uh, significant trend across the planet that tropical cyclones are becoming stronger. It's happening because of, well, because of us, because of anthropogenic climate change. Um, extreme weather is happening more often. And all these things are coming at us uh, and we need to be ready. We need to find ways to mitigate this. We need to find ways to slow down this train, but we also need to adapt because uh, the way things are going, right, unless we change our ways, uh, everything is becoming more extreme. So be ready, uh, be ready for hurricane season, be ready for any emergencies, and hopefully we won't have to deal with any, but you know, no promises. Thank you. David? So I just want to really emphasize that that preparedness issue, and that is all the more important because um, you know we are seeing more and more storms of of higher intensity. Um, you know, my first year in emergency management was in 2004 uh, here in Florida, and then you know dealt with Katrina in 2005. Um, we hit a drought after that here here in the state, and that led to a lot of complacency. Uh, it really did. People, you know, kind of forgot the lessons. Um, but then when uh, we responded to Hurricane Michael, which was a cat four and a half, five, <laughs> however you want to discuss that, uh, here in the Panhandle, and thought that was it. You know, that was the, the second major storm that I've dealt with in a career, Katrina being the first, and then also Harvey and, and Irma and all that. But I thought Michael was the event uh, that was going to define a career. And then the very next year, we see Dorian. Uh, and it was only through, you know, the the grace of the jet stream and, and the Bermuda High that we did not see Dorian uh, smash the, the east coast of Florida the way that it did the Bahamas. So um, these storms are becoming more, more prevalent, uh, more common, uh, and stronger. So uh, the first level of preparedness is yours uh, at the individual level. Um, you know, we are planning uh, at the state, and I know your counties are as well. We're trying to do as much as we possibly can. Um, but uh, the more you do, the happier you will be. That's what it boils down to. Um, 
because you know shelters are not great and uh, food and, and the water that we hand out is, is sometimes less than, than palatable. So uh, be prepared, uh, know your zone, know how to protect yourself and your family. Uh, that's, that's pretty much all I got. Okay. Well, thank you both for um, everything that you have shared with us and for all, all our participants that joined us today. Um, I have put two links on the chat. One is for the Clio Institute calendar of events. Um, stay tuned. We have a couple of more hurricane preparedness workshops and uh, webinars coming along in the next few weeks. Um, some of them are, are um, state specific. And some of them will be specific for the west coast of Florida. Some of them will be more um, general, but please stay tuned for more events coming up. Um, and as well as follow us on social media. Um, we'll follow up, like I said, with the resources and all the information here, you, um, share here today. But again, you know, the, the final words need, uh, really need to resonate with all of us that we need to be preparing now. Um, take advantage of the tax break um, that, it, that ends on, on June 4th. Um, and, you know, again, to reiterate that the climate crisis is exacerbating, um, you know, these extreme weather events, that it's exacerbating um, inequalities and socioeconomic um, inequities in our society. And, but at the same time, we're all being impacted by, by our, the climate crisis because we all live under the same roof called an atmosphere. And with that, I'll leave you today. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time in the next webinar and have a great day and please be safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.